Thank you guys so much. I hope you've been enjoying yourself so far. Um, this is going to be great. So I'm very, very excited to welcome Renata Amaro Morris and Gabriel Seibel, um, who are the co-founders of EAT. Uh, Renata Amaro Morris is the founder and CEO of EAT, a Los Angeles and Paris-based creative studio working internationally across design and branding. Joined by over 17 years of her own experience in the field, Renata's role in the studio is one as EAT's director and go-getter, comprehensively leading all facets of the business, collaborating with the likes of Amazon, Adidas, Netflix, Twitch, Redbull, EA Games, Blizzard Activision, Polygon, and many, many more. Featured in industry heavy hitters such as Forbes, Business Today, and Design Week, Renata continues to further her calling as a design educator and speaker. Gabriel Seibel manages EAT's operations based in Paris and LA. Since the beginning of his tenure as partner, COO, and head of production, Gabriel has successfully executed 400 plus projects for internationally renowned brands, overseeing everything from development through production. Together with EAT's founder and CEO, he has expanded the team to the US, Brazil, France, Germany, and Portugal, while cultivating a brilliant company culture in which creativity thrives. He is also a TEDx speaker and teaches marketing at IESEG School of Management in Paris. And this is actually his first time in New York, which I just learned. So he's, you know, thank you for coming all this way. Thank you. Yes, they've made a wonderful presentation. So I'm so excited to welcome them up. Please give them a round of applause. Hi guys, it's so nice to have you all and to be here. Hi everybody, it's so nice to be here. So thank you for the introduction and thank you so much for having us over. I'm Gabriel, this is Renata, uh, and we're here to talk about culture and design. And we're going to start with a quick video before we actually introduce the subject of uh, today's presentation uh, and everything that will take place uh, over an hour today. Thank you. Um, so we just wanted to bring a little quick video to explain who we are and just the values and the beliefs of the company before we actually introduce ourselves. So really starting from the beginning, I think we should take the time just to present ourselves and uh, tell uh, what we do and who we are in this company before actually introducing all of the subjects for culture and how we approach culture at EAT. Um, so I'm super delighted to share the stage with uh, my best friend and business partner, Renata. Uh, Renata has over 17 years of experience in branding and graphic design, and she's the founder and CEO of EAT, which is the company that we uh, co-lead together. Uh, the company started 17 years ago in Los Angeles, California. Renata was born and raised in Brazil. Uh, and the company comes with a big ambition, which is one of allowing us to live the dreams that we have, live in the cities that we want to live as immigrants, and be able to put that inspiration back into the work that we develop. Uh, 17 years later, Renata nowadays takes care of uh, marketing, the vision, client success, and just the overall direction for the company. She's really connected uh, with the evolving industries, and she has 
really this understanding of what's next and what's big. And it's pretty interesting, like as business partners, we have those conversations of what's the next big thing? And usually she's bringing the hottest things and I'm just like, oh, come on, this is not true. And two or three, three years later, like that becomes a big thing. So it's pretty cool, like the way we work. Uh, he lives in LA, she has an amazing husband called William who's here with us today and a, a bulldog called Oliver too. Uh, she's a certified meditation instructor, and she's the woman that changed my life. I started working with her when I was 19. I was an undergraduate, like you guys are. I was studying design, uh, and I was given opportunity uh, in the design industry, in the advertising world, by this woman who just created a business at that point and was needing help for someone that could be able to do anything and everything that needed to be done at that time. And I'm pretty, pretty proud to be here sharing the stage with her and talking to you guys today. Well, now I am, it's my turn to introduce Gabby. Um, we met when Gabby was only 19. We were in need of someone to write some copy for the company. Um, and this was like not a long time after the company was founded. So we started kind of working together really soon after everything started. Like I said, Gabby was only 19. He was always like an overachiever, always a little genius. And I was always so impressed by his self-taught way of doing things. So. Long story short, this guy starts working with us, takes over the entire production. At that time, we were such a small company, but um, always so impressed by the way that he does everything, we invited him to become a business partner. So he finally became a partner. Gabi has been living in Paris, France for over 10 years. He is the Frenchest of the Frenchest people you can ever meet. <laughs> um, and Gabi uh, pretty much taught himself how to do everything that he does today. So it's pretty, pretty impressive how he learned how to code, design, produce everything. And these days he is the company COO and also the VP of production. So Gabi leads all of the production team and all the artists. And he also, <laughs> like on the side, does an amazing job with uh, leading our finances and the, fin the teams that take care of the finances uh, at EAT. Um, Gabby is also an indoor, incredible guys, indoor cycling teacher, <laughs> which was just something that he started to do as a hobby and he became like a celebrity in Paris. So it's for me, it's <laughs> so on the side of leading a team of like so many people and then 25 prods at the time, he has this side gig, which is not a side gig. He, t he leads like 14 classes a week, which is insane. <laughs> He's like a superhuman. Um, Gabby is my, my business soulmate, and uh, it's kind of emotional to be sharing the stage. Don't cry. Don't cry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. Thank you so much. That's very nice. Um, yeah, and then we decided to bring some pictures of like our true relationship because that's culture for us too. Uh, it's not only about like sitting behind your computer and making decisions. We've been best friends and sharing our story together. So you have pictures from us pretty much everywhere in the world. Argentina, when Renato visited me in Paris, and that second picture is us yesterday. Uh, this is my first time in New York City, and I'm super happy to be here. So it's really like about the trust, the relationship, and not only like uh, co-signing an agreement of owning a business. So starting to get you what matters and like really the subject of uh, this, the conference this year, we're here to talk about synergy. And synergy is pretty much, in a classic definition, the combination of individual parts and how those individual parts, when combined, can create something stronger. So it's really about the ensemble, the great thing of this combination of all of those parts. And this is really like related to design and to culture and to work, which is what we wanted to share. It's culture for a design studio. Um, so in a nutshell, creativity is the combination of opposites. Creativity is the combination of just imagining freely and focusing that imagination. So imagining in an abstract way and focusing that imagination. It's the combination of the things that you lived and that you know with things that you don't know. And most importantly, the combination of you and the world, you and the people around you, you uh, and all of the people that you're interacting with on a daily basis. And this is what we wanted to talk about. Uh, and it's interesting, the metaphor with the rock and the world, it's like you uh, and the world, the culture is really this uh, exchange uh, and the way people are exchanging, communicating and talking. And for us as the, uh, design studio owners, the culture is very important. This studio was created for us to live anywhere in the world. So we're living in Paris, LA, we have people in Berlin, and this is way before COVID. So people are actually working remotely. We needed to create a set of values that would allow people to interact and relate to each other, and therefore allow the, the projects to take place in a nice way, uh, and in a way that makes us like happy and successful. 
This is what we want to talk to you guys about today. We're going to have a quick introduction of EAT. We won't take too long on that, just so you know who we are. And I'm going to share some examples of the works that we perform for different clients. Then we have a definition of culture, and we're going to share with you elements, bits and bytes of our culture manual. So we create a manual for culture, which is EAT's culture manual uh, regarding routine, communication, and behavior. And then we have an interactive group exercise about emotional intelligence. We're going to share with you an example of a challenging situation, and we're going to ask you to interact with, among each other and then come back to us with like, examples of how you felt and really like, how, you, how you would behave in such situation. And then finally, we'll open for questions and see if you have any thoughts. Um, and also, we'll share like, our Instagram uh, and just social media accounts if you guys want to reach out. And you out guys are going to have access to us forever. Forever. We're available. Um, so quick description of EAT. Hey, if you want to do that. Okay. Sure. So I always like to share a little bit about the vision and how this started. Um, it was pretty much the... Um, a great accent, accident of two big silver linings that happened to me. Um, one in Brazil and one in the States. So I have a background. I, was, I used to work at agencies and companies in, in Brazil back in the day. I actually moved to the States when I was 25. So I was, I was already per, uh, pursuing my career out there. And I found that there was this, um, this, this lack of... of um, it was a lack of sense with what the companies were offering to the creatives, to the creative people that were working there, and what they actually needed. And I felt like it was really cool to get into a big office with the ping pong tables and the beer on tap, and don't get me wrong, that's all great. But I felt like people, they, this, that, that could be a bigger investment in really listening to what the creative people really needed. Uh, and so that was the first light that came out into my head. I was like, well, I don't think it, it would be that hard to give the people what they need. So bottle that thought. I was super young, not thinking about having a company, had never owned a company at all. And my parents, they were always like, oh, you should follow the corporate world. You're going to be safer, blah, blah, blah. So push forward. I moved to the States. I take my master's at UCLA. And then I start looking for a job. And mind that. At that time, like back back in the day, it wasn't so cool and so sexy to be an immigrant. So after sending over 100 resumes, after I got my degree, I was never hired. So I was like, well, then I'm going to do something. If the opportunity is not going to knock on my door, then we're going to build a door. <laughs> and so that's how it was born. So yeah, and then this out of this idea to create a company that mimics what a creative team really needs. So here you go. We believe that creative people are fueled by real life experiences, and our entire culture is built out of this foundation. So then um, we did not start as a design studio. In the very beginning, we actually worked as a full service. So we used to provide clients with a plethora of services that you can imagine, like web, doing websites, doing working with social media, working with a bunch of different things. And then, but the plan was always to see what we loved to do, and then narrow it down and focus to be a, like a more focused studio. And it was very clear, very easy to see that design was our thing. Actually, the clients, they were telling us, like, you guys should pr pr uh, pursue the design. So it was, it, was very, it was a very clear path at that time. So here you guys can see, like, after almost 15 years, we've worked with uh, so many different clients. There's so many different projects. But until this day, our target audience is still the same. We work with uh, startups and global brands. And then talking about our team. So um, it, it, since the beginning, and I love that Gabby was mentioning that to you guys, like the company, uh, in the beginning, I didn't know if I was going to be able to stay in the States. Because as you guys can imagine, like I went through a long process of visas and all the visas you guys can imagine. Like I could have a PhD in immigration law at this point. But uh, so I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to stay there. So the company needed to fulfill this need in the very beginning of like, if, maybe if I would have to move to Amsterdam, we would, be, we would have to be able to go there. So we created an entire platform that could be completely online with teams and people that could be anywhere in the world. So that was the first way that we started thinking about where the team was going to be. And then we realized that that was the only way for us. So. You know, we these days have, uh, 
we actually navigated from having a small team to having a bigger team with almost like 25 people to then narrowing down back into having a team of like eight to 10 people. And we found that this is the best flow for us as a company. That's the way that works best for us. And that's what kind of fulfills the ambition and the life that we want to live. So we pretty much have a team of like a few people that manage everything. Uh, so Gabby and I are very uh, hands-on on the projects. We have two very talented project managers, two senior designers, one incredible person that, that takes care of this entire team, so he's our head of uh, people operations, and then we have a marketing manager and a content producer. So this is pretty much the team that we have. And then when it comes to services, we try to be very lean and very straightforward. So our bread and butter is still branding. That's uh, how a lot of the clients, they come to us in the first, pla pl first place, is like to design their brands and to create their rebrands and to, to create stuff from scratch for them. Then the graphic design of all things. So anything you can imagine, like digital, print, motion graphics, you name it. And then finally, Gabby and I started uh, finding a lot of uh, fulfillment with doing this kind of thing. So like teaching workshops, like sharing, sharing knowledge with with, with people that are wanting to, to listen to it. And so um, this ended up, this, <clears throat> this um, service started as in a very unpretentious way. And then it became something that we started to develop. And actually, we're going to formally uh, launch this service, the workshops, this year. It's coming soon. And then just a couple of examples of the work that we perform. I brought three or four. We have a very extensive portfolio that you guys can find online, but um, this is one of the projects that we developed last uh, two years ago. That's for Twitch. Uh, Twitch was a need to create a brand to actually foster co-streaming. So have people stream together, and they needed to have a brand uh, and a streamer package. So this is a project where we, don't, we didn't actually create the brand. We were working with an agency that created the brand, but we're creating all of the assets for that project. So making sure that we're creating the animations, all of the graphics and all of like the transitions uh, so that the streamers can actually use that package uh, and through that package be able to co-stream uh, with other people uh, through the platform uh, on Twitch. Another project that we did that's in 2017, it's a sub-brand for Netflix. And it was a very challenging project because we were actually working with a brand that has a very set of guidelines that are very strict and very specific. So you can just play around and a lot with them. Um, and the goal of the project was to create a channel for sci-fi and fantasy. So it's a social media channel that will gather all of the content related to the programming that is focused on that type of content. It's called Netflix and X. And the branding was all about the X in this window uh, and showcasing and just displaying different materials um, with that brand. And then you have some examples of animation. So we did the whole thing, like branding, colors, the whole look and feel. And keep in mind that this is all being designed by, the, by a team that is all around the globe. So no one is like sitting in an office all around. Uh, we're all around the globe spread out in different cities. That's one of our favorite projects, and I brought a little bit more slides for, the, for this one. Um, who knows Ninja here? One, two, three, four, five. Couple people or just a couple of shy people. <laughs> so Ninja is like the biggest streamer and biggest celebrity on YouTube. You guys should have heard of him, for those who know. Um, and he was in desperate need of a new brand. So we were approached by his management team, uh, and they were needing a new brand for Ninja. And they were needing uh, a refresh for that identity because Ninja started approaching collabs with bigger brands, and he was just you know, uh, using his brand for different things in the market. And we were called to do the entire exercise. So the whole, the whole definition of values, colors, the whole design system for that brand. Um, what was very interesting about this is that Ninja is an icon, and we wanted to create an icon for Ninja. So really, like we leveraged his iconic blue hair to create a shape uh, that really translates that idea. And you can see through the typography and all of the elements that uh, you see the fonts are not the same, so you have like different fonts in the actual logo type. We really wanted to translate and convey this idea of pl pl plurality, div diversity, and just the fact that we're bringing like different elements to this, because this brand is, was all about this. It's like a non-exclusive brand, it's inclusive, it's approachable, it's vivid, it's live, it's friendly. So those are like some of the materials that we created for him. This is one of the biggest projects that we had in terms of like public exposure. Uh, the project was actually launched live uh, on Jimmy Fallon, uh, and the brand was launched in um, Times Square, just there, <laughs> two blocks away. Yeah, and even like Jimmy Fallon was impressed with with the work. So I have 
some, I have one slide, yes, yeah, so just, just overall like compositions and mockups with the brand identity, and here you have them. So the brand was actually launched live and we're all watching, so it was a worldwide la launch. It was a very important one for us. And then a final example of what we did and projects that we do, and just to explain to you why we're bringing all of this, we want you to understand that we execute all types of projects in the design world. So not really only branding projects or uh, rebrands, but actually like projects that are complex and hybrid. And in this case, for example, we're, we were actually working with an experiential agency and they were creating a hotel for Adidas during Coachella in 2019, just before COVID. And they wanted to create an entire venture, an entire hotel, where they would bring, bring all of those celebrities to produce content. And all of that content would be streamed on Instagram. And we were hired to create the brand for that activation. The project was named Adidas Sport Club. Uh, and we created the whole identity, which was a homage uh, to all of the legacy advertising language for Adidas. So we were actually going through magazines and ads from Adidas from the 70s. From back in the day. And cut, cutting them off and creating all of those compositions uh, to get to that type of language. And later on, that language was expanded to a variety of things, including uh, a basketball court in the event, in the facility, um, that was just by Coachella in 2019. Uh, as I mentioned, we worked with an experiential agency that was actually like creating all of those things and making them happen. And we have a video of like the entire activation, which is the last case study that we have before we actually talk about culture. It's a pretty cool video that showcases all of the work that was done and how the branding work goes 360 to just, you know, display the values of the brand throughout. <laughs> So that's just a sneak peek of the video, and then it just goes on. It's an example of everything that was created and all of like the points of contact for, for it. So this project was created by a team of like seven people and were spread out all around the globe. We're communicating online. That's, again, way before COVID, so way before Zoom was a thing, way before Slack, and just making sure that we're bringing all of those folks together and having them be inspired uh, to actually create this, which is kind of like the segue to this next subject, which is culture, and which is what we're gonna talk about and what the exercise is about. Uh, the only way that we managed to stay in business for 15 years and to create all of those projects and even have our relationship thrive and be successful is because from the beginning we had a very clear set of values of what we wanted this company to embody and the values that why we're here, why we're doing what we do and most importantly the way we shared those with the team and the way we kind of like teach them to understand how we work, why we're here, what are like the ways that we communicate and culture is very, it's a very important element for a business both internally and externally. Uh, externally, it's the way like you perceive that company, it's the positioning of the company, it's the image, it's the communication, it's the identity. So that's like from an external point of view. But from an internal point of view, it's really the way people interact with each other. It's how you write an email, it's how you present yourself on a meeting, it's how you manage problems and how you handle like difficult situations and diff difficult conversations with your peers and with your colleagues. And really, we believe that the best equity that we could have in a company is our culture, it's the way people interact, because that helps us with not only employee retention and performance, but, but just really living a happy life. Um, so you guys should be thinking, okay, all good, I understand all of that, but what does it mean? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for a design business or a design initiative? At the end of the day, I think what we're trying to say is that uh, 
having the best talent is not enough. Uh, you need to be able to get that best talent in a situation, a context, a scenario, a eco an ecosystem where people feel that they're respected, where people feel that they're seen, that they're heard, and therefore, whenever they're in that situation, they will be able to deliver their best work, and that best work will be seen, and therefore, you get clients, and you get wealth, and then we just thrive uh, as, as a company, as a design studio. So making sure that we're not only focusing on the people or the culture, it's an intersection of both of them. One thing that I was discussing with Renata yesterday that is very interesting is that I think culture is not something that you impose to people. You don't tell people it's like this, it's like that, and something that is static. It's like it's there's no such thing as having a culture or not. Every company will have a company, a culture, either they think they have it or not, Even either they nurture the culture or not. It is there, and the absence of one is one. Think about that. And then, so how do we how do we instill that culture? How do we foster that? How do we stimulate that type of culture? I think the first thing that a company needs to do is to understand what are the core values and the things that we're trying to communicate uh, with the people that are working with us and our colleagues and uh, all of all of the team. Uh, so it's really about like doing soul seeking and business planning and, and understanding really the values that are important for us. Renata and I we revisit those values every year and every three or four years we realign on those values because as human beings I think we change and as business owners we change and therefore those values will evolve over time uh, so we can make sure that we can share those values with the team and those values can be applied. Uh, make sure that the values that we'll share with you guys are not the values that are the most important ones. This is just our perspective and our understanding of a design company uh, and other companies have different values and different ways to approach business, but those are the things that are important for us and that we share uh, with our team uh, and that we try to instill uh, and make sure they are present in our culture. Renata wrote those five values, so um, Renata is the best person to talk about each one of them. I wanted to tie back to the theme of the conference here, which is synergy and uh, the what we're trying to talk about is like the synergy between the designers with the designers and the designers with the rest of the team and the team with the designers. So your future. How are you going to be interacting with your peers, your bosses, and the industry out there, right? So we, we strongly believe that a, a company is able to create a, a very thriving and fulfilling culture if they really know themselves. And in our opinion, that starts with really good branding. And why is that? It's because when you go through a very thorough exercise of branding, you ask yourselves a lot of questions that you're going to have to figure out what the answers are to get to know the company. It's almost like the company has its own soul, its own personality, and the company starts to speak to you. So in our opinion, the companies that put a lot of attention into creating a good brand and really answering those questions, they're able to know how to hire well. And when they hire well, they're able to create the synergy within the teams. They're able to have a team that will talk to each other in however values the company is expecting this culture to be created. Does that make sense? So we start with the branding. We ask the clients the right questions, so they get to know themselves, so they get to listen to this company's personality, so they can hire the best team ever. And one thing, one thing that we take a lot of pride is that we've always had a really good feeling of how to hire the team. So to the values, first and foremost, of course, it's really important that we can design, right? Like this is what we do. So design excellence, it's obviously the main value that we have. Also, those values is something that we find to be the unique selling points for EAT. And oh, year after year, we continue to see that the clients, they come to us because of those values. So it feels like it's very aligned where this is how we perceive ourselves and this is also how the clients perceive us. So that's, there's alignment there. We're global. We are intrinsically global, which means that it's not just a set of offices that in a bunch of different countries where people don't interact. And um, so it is a team that lives and has problems in all these different countries, and we are constantly together understanding what the other is going through. So when we are working with a client, the, client, the clients get a lot of that, especially the clients that are trying to launch something internationally. They get this really cool point of view of people that are living and breathing and have getting tickets in different countries, so truly global. We believe that without process, we don't have freedom. 
And think about a team that is never really under the same roof, uh, apart from the team trip that we do once a year. So without the processes, we would never be able to guarantee that we would be able to deliver at the end. So we hold very tight to the processes for really everything to make sure that we can go from A to Z and, and deliver successfully. People, very proud to tell you guys that this is something that we felt, not always felt like we could share. So EAT is an immigrant-owned company. Um, actually, most of us are immigrants. Um, I'm, we're both Latin people. Uh, there are members of the LGBTQIA plus um, community in the company. Um, and we take a lot of pride of being like truly diverse. And I said that this is not something that we used to share because back in the day, uh, being, being um, Im an immigrant, it was not something very well perceived in different countries. So we used to really hide behind our pixel perfect, perfect deliverables and not really share with people that were Brazilians. And then, you know, in the past few years, we launched our rebrand, which is that video that you guys saw in the beginning, and went all out with like who we are, being very loud and proud of who we are. And then warmth. That's also part of what I was just saying. Like when you are an immigrant and you move culture, you move countries, uh, you get a set of cultural things that you kind of get to choose, and that's the positive side of like moving countries, right? So let's say some of my Brazilianness, I wanted to live in Brazil and I wanted to acquire some new values in America, and some of my Brazilianness I wanted to keep, and the warmth was something that I made a decision to keep. And I always share with the team that people want to be loved. So even if this culture, sometimes in the States or sometimes in different countries in Europe, people don't have a culture that is as warm as ours in Brazil, I believe that people at the end, they all want to be loved. So when clients come into the office, I hug them and I don't care. You know, sometimes they're kind of like awkward. I'm like, come here. I'm gonna give you a hug. It really works. I believe that it works because people feel like they can trust. And then when there's a lot of talent involved and they get the delivers but that they want and they feel like they're heard, it works. And that's not only with the clients, but also with the team. So those are the values. So, you know, what do we do? Then we take those values, that creates the culture, that will, you know, become the deliverables and, and, and what we deliver. And then people keep coming back. So we created this culture manual that we're going to be talking to you guys about because people started to get interested in how we do it. And this is what um, pretty much this, uh, our entire culture is centered in this effectiveness and simplicity. And so the culture manual, uh, we created this as with this need that we believe that in all kinds of relationships, we're going to be more successful if we know what's expected from us. So I get a lot of my friends that come to me and, and talk about the problems that they're having at work. And that's usually for the same reason. There's no synergy in them knowing what's expected from them and the expectations that the company have of them. And so this culture manual is to share our beliefs, our values, how, we how do we communicate with people, how we expect that the team communicate with each other, and mind that this is not set in stone. This is something very flexible where everyone can come and challenge the culture manual from the company, but this is just us sharing with people and communicating like this is our idea of a healthy environment. So this is why we created this, this manual. So the first topic that we have to talk about, the, that we have to talk about the culture menu is routines. Um, quick question, just a quick check. Who has, who, who could say that like you have a routine, for example? Who is willing to say that you have a structured routine? Be proud, guys. Just raise your hand if- Keeping anyone. a routine is fucking hard. Yeah. And from those who raised the hand, do you guys think that this benefits your daily life and productivity? Yeah, so that's pretty much it. And I think routines uh, from a professional standpoint, personal standpoint, are there for that. It's for you to be able to structure uh, your work and be able to understand where you start and where you end. 
in an online business where we're working remotely with different time zones and different profiles, it's very important that we can establish boundaries and exactly like when does your day start and when does your day end so we don't have people overworking or bringing the stress of that remote work onto their personal lives, etc. Uh, so in the culture manual, we have a chapter only focused on routines and every time that we're bringing a new team member or that we're training someone, we're going over those different routines so they make sure to understand what are the rituals uh, that we go through as a company. A couple of examples that we, uh, that we apply, we have a weekly meeting every Tuesday, and this is the moment where we take the time to share like, just the overall direction of the week and where the company is headed, and sometimes we use that time for presentations uh, of specific departments too. Um, you have focused meetings, like all-ins meetings for department, where the department is actually sharing the goals, where we stand, the to-do list, and some KPIs. Uh, one-on-ones are meetings that we have only between two people where we have more like of a time to share how we're feeling, where we're coming from, what are the difficulties and the struggles that we have, kickoff meetings to start projects, result in budget meetings, and so forth. And really understanding the nature of those different meetings and the nature of those different checkpoints allows you as a professional to know what's expected from you and what's the vibe of the meeting. Is it more of a laid back meeting? Is it more of a like a focused professional meeting um, and so forth? We're working with several different time zones in. I think when we say we're an international business, it doesn't mean that we're like a 200 people business that has three offices and those offices don't communicate or barely communicate. We're a very small team and all of those folks are really based internationally and we're all exchanging daily all the time. So when Renata wakes up at 7 a.m., I know that from 7 to 9, we're not talking work because she has her entire personal life and she will start work at 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Pacific would be 6 p.m. for me in France. So I have a two-hour window from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. to actually tell her, listen, I have a problem, there's this client that is unhappy or we have a big proposal that we need to sign. And I know that like I have that two-hour window to deliver work and after that time, from 11 a.m. forward, which is 8 p.m. for me, I'm off and I'm gonna live my personal life. And then you factor into that math all of the other time zones and you create those rituals with calendars and with just establishing your boundaries so we can really be the best professionals that we need to be in the times that we defined for us and at the same time be able to just live life and be inspired outside so we're not just working around the clock. All of those things were things that we learned over time, guys. Like this is the honesty. I started yeah, I was gonna say, it was far from being always like, I, like I that. I started working in this company when I was, I was 19 years old, at that time I was working from France, we weren't even telling the clients that. I was ashamed of not working in the United States and being in France, and the clients were like, are you in LA? And I'm just like, oh no, I'm not in LA, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell them. And at some point, I started telling people, I'm working from France, and then the clients went like, oh, that's pretty cool, are you in Paris? And I was just like, oh, people think that's actually cool. It's a cool thing. And we learned that we should like own our truth and really like be open about who we are and the structure that we have and establish those limits. So goodbye the 1 a.m. calls and all of the crazy weekend work and really like walk our talk and live our truth, which is creating time for us to experiment life and be proud of that life and put that inspiration, inspiration back into the work that we develop. A couple of tips, and I think that can be useful for you in your professional career, in your professional life. Really respect your time and your colleagues' time. So if you have a 20-minute conversation, be on time. And if you have a 20-minute talk, don't use the 20 minutes to talk all alone and leave your, the person in front of you out of time. So really being aware of everyone's times is very important. Preparing your meeting is also very important. Instead of just getting to a meeting and being like, oh, what's the subject about? And then you just don't know, and you're burning everyone's times, especially when you're working with people in different time zones, that's very important. Uh, have a document with all of the points, the discussions, the conclusions that is shareable and that we can actually like come back to and read what was decided is important. And I think one of the most important points is to be in the meeting 100%. Uh, we have a lot of calls and a lot of meetings and that's not necessarily a good thing. Like having a bunch of meetings is not a measure of success. Uh, and I'm the first one to say like, I don't need to be in this meeting. I don't, you can lead this meeting without me. But when I'm in a meeting, I need to be there 100% and be present with a nice background, paying attention, not being on your phone and really being able to give to your colleagues, your peers, your clients, your best presence. This is very important, especially in an online world where we can be easily distracted 
just if you're if you're in the meeting, if you signed up for that, if you said I'm available, then really be there and do the meeting like uh, own, own the time that you're offering people. And finally, it's okay to not be okay. Uh, we learned this the hard way. We've been working with a team for 15 years. People go through a lot of things. We go through struggles. We go through ups and downs. Uh, we have all types of issues. And I've been always telling the team that works directly for me that I rather know and I rather them tell me I'm not feeling okay today. I'm having a bad day. I'm having like family problems. Whichever problem you may have, that's totally okay. I rather know that so I can jump in and do your work for you or bring someone to help and I'll give you all the time instead of you not telling me, trying to perform with the struggle and then we realize that there was a problem two or three days later when we actually see the deliverable and we see that the person was burned out or very tired, etc. cetera. Um, so really like communicate uh, and sharing more than less is important because people can't just you know, guess or, uh, or know if you're, not, if you're not telling them that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about communication, and that's uh, also something that is not set in stone, but it's, a w it's like when we share with people a little bit about how we expect the communication to flow um, in all the different verticals that we touch, like our internal emails, our external emails, like how do we talk to clients, uh, and then the etiquette just in general. And if you guys just think about it, um, there's so many different things that can affect, uh, that can, uh, that can create noise when people are communicating, uh, just by people just not understanding each other. That could be just because they're from different cultures and the way that people talk and express themselves is just naturally different because they, they come from different places and in the places where they live, people communicate in a different way, so that's one. In our team, we have that. There's also the people who come from different backgrounds, different agencies. Maybe you work for a very strict business that forces you to communicate in one way or another. So how important it is that we are aligned, right? That we know, okay, guys, here, this is how we try to communicate. What do you think, right? So if we move on uh, into the next one, how do we, this is super important. That's a silly question, but can, I, can you guys raise your hands? Like, how many of you have written a business email? Oh, you guys are professionals. <laughs> yeah, so I can run really quickly through this one, but like, because we've had in our team, like uh, people who, it, it was their very, very, very first job and they have never r written an email and that's totally okay. And I feel like there's this, this thing where like, it's, it's wrong to ask how, because it feels like, oh, how small do you are, you are you? Because you don't know, you've never written an email, but no, you know? So I think it is important. This is something that it is in our, in our culture manual. So the usual things, like you start an email with greetings, you're, cu you're courteous with people, you have alignment with, alignment with them, you're assert assertive in your emails and the way that you talk, but you're also gentle and you align with people saying, what do you think? Like you ask what you need from them, you're direct, but you're also, you know, you apply this courtesy. Then we have the internal emails, which is probably an extension of the external emails, but you know, a bit more informal, but always remembering that it's important to connect with your peers and how you're gonna communicate with them. And then the last part, it's something that in a communication process, for the communication to be effective, there's two parts. One person is talking about what they mean, and the other person is understanding or not. And in between that, like I said before, there can be a lot of noise. That usually comes from the lack of assertiveness for a lot of different reasons, but that's why it's so important that you ask questions. And I know that this sounds not important, but in our company, even between us, this has been a savior where we don't communicate in the wrong media. So let's say I'm really frustrated. Remember that we're nine hours difference. I'm in LA. He's in Paris. Gabby's going to bed, I'm waking up. I have a whole different type of energy when I'm waking up, and then sometimes things can get across really wrong, and that can create an, a, a problem. So we always take the time to like watch our emotions. How do I feel right now? And I always ask, like, how do you arrive here to this conversation? Or, or just being honest, like, I'm not ready to talk about this right now. And this is so important, to be able to communicate and say, I'm not ready or can we talk in a different place, or not to vomit things on people by text, or a massive audio on WhatsApp. Like We have certain places to communicate, and guys, I swear to you, this is so important. This can save so much. This can save your, your job. So to really step back, 
pause and think, how do I feel? How do I feel like this person is feeling? And what's the, is it the right thing to do to like go after and try to have a whole argument with this person right now because I'm unhappy? Think twice. So thinking about how to ask questions and say, hey, I don't really understand what you mean. Do you mind explaining to me? And so forth, right? So I'm all about communication. <laughs> And then the third and final one is behavior. Uh, we have 13 minutes left, so I think we can just you know, focus on this one and focus more on the exercise. Yeah, yeah. So just gonna quickly go through those. Those are kind of like the values and uh, the expected behaviors that we, um, that we really stimulate and foster in the company and we expect people to have. Uh, our, approach, our approach is centered on people and it's really like how people are treated, how people live the work experience, therefore that will impact the work that we create. So we really expect uh, and we really try to stimulate passion uh, in everything that is done. We expect people to be uh, delivering that passion, delivering that emotion, delivering that almost like positive obsession in the work and we're constantly like giving new ways for people to be educated, we're sharing references, we're traveling for conferences and really have this appreciation for the type of work that we do. Um, yeah, like we mentioned in the beginning, being an excellent designer is not enough, at least at EAT. We don't uh, foster a culture of comp com competitiveness, we foster a culture of teamwork. So this empathy, this ability to work as a team, that we are all going to get there and that we are all going to shine is very important to us. Just organization and respecting the time of each other. So following the process, delivering something that is organized, that is easy for someone to jump in and actually use, is very important for us too. And also, obviously, adaptability. So there is the respect for the process, but there is also the ability to be adaptable because things don't always go our way. We have no control about everything at all times. So to be able to adapt when things don't go our way, it's really important as a behavior. Uh, being able to be humble and honest, and humble does not mean not sharing your point of view. Being humble means being able to share your point of view, but at the same time understand that the result of the work is not the result of one's point of view, it's the result of a collective creation. So we really expect people to share what they think, uh, but at the same time not think that this is the designer's project or the CEO's project, but really understand this is a collective creation. Uh, being able to be honest and speak your truth is very important for us. To have autonomy in a company that we're never working under the same roof, it's pretty much impossible for us to micromanage. So if we're hiring you, it's because we truly believe in the work that you're doing and that we believe that you're capable to delivering the best that you can without us having to like micromanage ev every detail. And time management, being able to own your time and understand how much time things take and letting people know that I'll need more time. I won't be able to deliver this today as I promised, trying to let people know as early as possible so we can actually like uh, have a good separation between personal life and work, play uh, and work. Uh, it's very important for us, especially with like all of those time zones and the time difference. Uh, communicating, I'll need more time. I won't be able to deliver this to you. The worst thing you can do for a project manager to a project manager is to let the project manager know the day of the deadline, last minute, oh, I think I'll need more time. Just like being able to understand that I won't be able to deliver this as I expected with the time that I was given, so I'll just let you know right now, this is not a lot of time, can we talk about it? And really being able to have that open conversation, that's key for the success of the project. And then just following what I said about choosing the right media to talk up, to give feedbacks, to understand the improvements, so at EAT, like we, we really value the feedback because we believe that that's how we grow. So to understand like when I can be better and how can I be better, it's very important. But we have the right places and the right times to give that feedback. So you don't want to be texting somebody and saying that you're disappointed with something that happens. Like you, at it, we have like moments for that so that it is, is made in a constructive way and we're not pushing someone down instead of like creating something positive. And then the final one is just respecting like the hierarchy and the way the co company is established. We're not a horizontal company, we're a vertical company, but we're very kind and very open. And we, we expect that type of openness to be respected so people don't go to the other side uh, and you know, just try to uh, share too much with you and therefore get, try to get in your life and end up hurting you. So really respecting the boundaries is very important. At the end of the day, the growth happens when you have the right people and the right culture, and this is what we're trying to share with you guys. Uh, 
in the market, like and in the in the industry, just making sure that you understand the culture of the company. Maybe a lot of you will create your own business and be business owners. Try to be able to really understand what are the values behind what you're doing and try to uh, make sure that people get it uh, and they get it right. This is the key for success for a company, for longevity, for having like long lasting relations, relations like I have with Renata, that's very important. At the end of the day, people are designing for people. So if you live a happy, fulfilled life and if you respect it and trust it, therefore the work that you're creating will be a reflection of that. And this is what we ultimately believe in. Um, and way beyond just k those KPIs of like employee turnover, productivity, profit, the whole, n all of the numbers in the PL, at the end of the day, just, just allows us to live a happier life. Uh, and this is the purpose uh, behind both of us being business owners and owning a business. We're trying to walk our talk and live like a happy and fulfilled life. And most importantly, allow and enable everyone that is working with us to live uh, something that is similar and alike. And here's the exercise. This is the fun part. I'll let Renata quickly explain what we're going to do, and then we're going to take the time uh, for the exercise. We might go over like five or ten minutes, and then this will be, will be everything. I think we should jump the... Yeah. Cool. So, guys. Should I just go to the exercise? Yeah. Okay. There you go. So, we strongly believe that emotional intelligence is the skill of the presence, the present and the skill of the future. If you guys think about that design is made by people for people, there's people everywhere. So to be able to understand, accept, and identify your emotions, in my humble opinion, is the most important skill that any professional could have. So the exercise that we're going to do today is I want you guys to find a pair, find one person to work with, and then I have here the idea, like, sit far enough away to have the sense of privacy, but we don't really need to do that. So find your pair, please. Let's do it. Everybody. Find a pair. Let's go, let's go, let's go. There's no reason to be ashamed. You guys all be love good. each it's other. Be good. You're all good. It's time to get vulnerable. So here's what we're going to do. Each uh, member of the pair is going to share a time where they felt, where they had an experience that they felt like a victim. And I want you guys to describe that really well to each other. And then the other person is going to share how they felt by listening to that story. Each person is going to have five minutes to complete the exercise. Then we are going to have a group discussion. And time. Good luck. You guys can do it. assim, ó, no limite. Posei muito. Dá tudo que tu tem. Vai. Tá, vamos ler essas merdas. Né? Faz uma pergunta e levanta, raise your hands. Ah, quanto tempo? 
A gente tem que saber a quanto tempo a gente está falando. Tá. Tá, peraí. Meus cabelos são meio frios. Abre o espacato. Abre o espacato. O Gabriel abre o espacato. Não, eu tenho minha limitação é bem menor. Eu consigo fazer uma car wheel. O que, que era, Manu? Isso. Ai, eu amo. Isso, mas olha pro computador. A guria que vai ter que fazer igual a Liz, Liz. Como é que eu posso fazer? Eu posso escrever assim. Tá bombado. Tá bombado. Tá bombado. Gastão. Tá bombado. Tá Eu Mas vai aqui na rua. Uhum. Do you guys, how are we? <laughs> Do you guys feel like we're almost done? We are, guys, guys. We almost done. Were you guys able to do it? Talk to me. <laughs> we good? Just like we don't want to go over too much, to not be disrespectful and against our own culture manual. <laughs> So we have a couple of questions, uh, and then... So the plan here is just to do a group discussion. So, you know, you guys are welcome and should raise your hand so we can kind of like, you guys can share the experience. We're going to ask you guys some questions. Um, so first thing is like, what did you think first when you were told to share a difficult experience with another person? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Oh my God, I don't want to do it. I'm blocked. I love it. Like, the anyone wants to share? And it was like live, like one, two, three, go. <laughs> and I, so. shyness is just not allowed right now. You guys come and share with me, please. Who wants to go? Yeah. There you go. Thank you. You guys have microphones? Okay. Hi. Okay. I, I can just yell. Okay. My first thought was an experience where you felt like a victim was a very loaded question, I thought. And there's kind of a spectrum where like it could be such a minor little inconvenience to something that's really horrible and life altering. So it's like, then you're kind of thinking, what am I comfortable sharing? What is the other person going to share? You just don't know. It's hard. Right. right. Cool. Very cool. Anyone? Who else? Right there. For me, my first thought, I was like, okay, I'm sitting at this conference and I don't know anyone, but I'm here sharing my vulnerable story with someone, a complete stranger, and I don't know anything about them. Um, they don't know much about me, but here I am being vulnerable with that. And to share my story, it was something that I found personally to me that was like touching. It was hard to share and talk to my friends already about it. But the fact that I was able to sit with a stranger here at a conference and tell them about it, it was like a really special moment for me to be able to share my story. Yeah, um, so basically the first thing I thought about was kind of the baggage around the term like victim mindset and like how people have said, oh, you've had a victim mindset before and like how much I've tried to eradicate that from my mind. Um, and I wound up telling um, you like a story that like 
I had thought through a lot and like I had very recently like gone rid of like the emotional connotation. Like I used to cry when I told it to people. Um, so it was definitely like a very difficult thing to admit that at one point I felt like a victim when this happened. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. I have a, f a fourth and final point if you want to make. I actually wanted to talk, but yeah. So I was actually listening to her and she was sharing a story like what she actually went through and it was kind of relatable because you are from the same uh, like industry product design. So I actually tried to like come up with solution and say, oh, did you try to do this? Did you try to do this? And it was that ki kind of good. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I think a lot of those answers talk about vulnerability and how you feel and like having a hard time exposing yourself. And I think this is one of the points on like problem solving yeah. whenever we're approaching that type of thing is like learning to be vulnerable but not sacrificing yourself or oversharing or sharing something that is true and comfortable for you so we can actually get to a point where um, we can get you a solution. And ultimately to pay attention to the emotions that you're feeling and also pay attention to the emotions that the other person is feeling. So then the second question would be, how did you feel when, when, how did you feel when the other person shared? Who wants to talk? When about? you heard. Yeah. When you heard the story. I felt a sense of, uh, I felt like my feelings were validated um, because they received what I said and they expressed how they felt um, if they were in those shoes too and knowing that another human being would experience the same feelings that I felt in that situation made me feel more as though I was a part of a community. Amazing. Anyone else? Yeah, adding to that, it was just the realization of we're all human mm -hmm. and we all come from very different places here, different backgrounds, but we're all united by that. We all have feelings and emotions and that it's okay to be vulnerable even at a design conference. Exactly. <laughs> Who else? Okay. Next question. So how did you feel after acknowledging in accepting your own emotions by sharing. I think she mentioned a little bit of that, that you said that you felt good about it and being able to open up. I think keep in mind that we had like an entire very difficult conversation in five minutes, which is really not exactly. the times that we usually, that, that usually takes, but really like if you manage to feel anything out of that, uh, you can share. And if you didn't feel anything, that's also okay and that's also valid because we didn't But also a lot of the times in the business world, things are gonna happen in a nanosecond. You're gonna get that really nasty email from the client that uh, it, you feel in your stomach and it's like, oh, uh, it that ruins your day and you're shaky and you don't know what to start thinking and you want to respond and you feel like that was unnecessary and you feel like you want to be, to react. You know, this is exactly what we're trying to see here. It's like you guys are being put on spot to share something that you're not expected to share so that you can kind of deal with those emotions and think about them. So what's the next question? So do you guys feel like this exercise helps you to accept how some experiences will make us feel different ways and that it's okay to feel a certain way through uh, negative experiences? Yes or no? And do you guys feel a little bit, maybe a teeny bit more at peace after accepting <laughs> and learning that this is possible and you guys are welcome to feel your feelings? I always do. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, I think at the end of the day, what we wanted to share, uh, if you guys, if you want to change to the next one, Gabby, um, yeah, this is just an idea for you guys to see that in, in the business world, when you guys start your careers and everything, you are going to face some pretty interesting moments where your emotions are going to be triggered. And, and again, the idea that it's really important to do this exercise of like, how do I feel? Pause. How do I think that this person feels? This second question, guys, it's the golden nugget. And it is very hard to think about the second question when you're extremely triggered. So it is okay to say, I'm not ready. I'm just so pissed off right now. 
I'm not ready to understand your emotions, but I will be. But it's not now. Maybe it's going to be in 24 hours. And then to feel confident to communicate and say, I'm so sorry. I'm really irritated right now. This serves for your relationships with your partners, your parents, your dogs, everything. So quick tips for us to finish. Reflect and be an observant of your own emotions. This is, it takes practice to like know when you need to pause, if you need to ask to go to the bathroom, and sit down and feel like, how do I feel now? And learn how to learn the words that you can speak to yourself. Like, I feel agitated. I feel irritated. I feel like I want to throw myself on the floor. I feel like I'm going to throw up. All those things. And na name them, right? Ask others for, sp for perspective. Like, how do you, what do you think? How do you feel? How did that make you feel? There's such richness in asking how people feel about something. How did that make you feel? Like, when I shared this difficult thing, we go through, like, imagine how hard it is to, like, you manage a whole business with someone who is your best friend, and sometimes we have tough truths to share with each other. So it's like, how do you arrive to this conversation, Gabby? Oh, I'm calm. I had a good morning. I taught just eight classes, not 14. I feel good. And then so it's like, all right. So then you share. And then did that make you feel sad? Like, I'm sorry. I don't mean to hurt you with what I'm going to sa say to you. But this is what I want to share. You see how it's different than me? Like, eh, you know? Um, the pause. It's pretty much the king of this entire conversation. Sometimes I try to imagine a red light that flashes into my head. And I'm just like, red light. I can't talk right now. I need to pause with this right now. And it's like, when you're triggered, it's, it's in there. You're like, whew, you're sweating, you're angry, whatever happened, the client was horrible. And to pause, it's so hard sometimes. But that's when you, I don't know, feel, think about what's your pause. What do you do? You go on your phone, you watch a movie, whatever it is, right? And then explore the why. Try to minimize the gap between you and the person who's causing the emotions. Which, like I said, sometimes it's not going to be in the same moment. Sometimes you're going to need some time. And I bet you that you can always, or I would say 90% of the times, you can ask for the time you need. Don't think that you don't have that time. Because everybody's going to rather you bringing something better to the table with the best emotion of your emotions that you can, then you just like, blah, you know? And then when, this one is so tough, like when criticized, don't take offense, <laughs> just kidding. But like, yeah, try, try to get into that place. Meditation helps a lot to, when you, when you try to have a practice of like, um, you know, putting your mind at ease, it really helps you to deal with the stressors of the world. It helps you to deal with the things that the world is never going to stop throwing stuff at you. And you are your own boss to like make sure that you're doing the work that you can do to feel less stressed, to feel more at ease. So, and practice. It comes with practice. So thank you so much for taking Thanks the for time having us. to listening to us. I don't know if anyone has any questions. I don't know if we have time for questions, maybe. Yeah. Um, I'll just give you the mic. Can we do like two minutes for questions? Is it okay? Yeah? Sure. Yes. So, my question is how did you come, come up with the name It Studio? <laughs> yeah. I knew it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, when we first started, um, I wanted a name that was short, sweet and short and weird. I wanted something that could just, uh, that was not the common out there. And in the beginning, we used to work with uh, the entertainment, art, and talent communities. So we created this acronym in the beginning that this is what it meant. And then we ended up dropping the acronym in the sense that it just became it studio. And we stopped like sharing that that's what it meant. But the true, true, honest reason is that. Thank you. Um, hi, thanks for coming. Um, Thank you. So what would you say defines the line between um, vulnerability and oversharing? You can do it. I mean, I can tell you how I do it. I don't know if it's a rule. 
it's I use my intuition a lot. And there's a lot about reading the room and also being just being really cautious with like being respectful to yourself and being respectful to the other person. So I try to pause and really think what, what I'm doing when I'm in a conversation. So uh, I think, you know, you will know when to stop if you are really taking the time to listen to yourself and to read the room. Those are the two really important, I would say, to do, like things to do. It's like you pay attention to yourself when you are sharing and you read the room. You read if the person is really there with you. You, 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 you see their body language, you see their eye contact. Because if you're sharing with someone who's not interested, it doesn't feel good to share. But if you're sharing with someone that is there with you, there's an energy that is there. And you're like, oh, cool, I can trust you, or this is good. But then you think about the, the bigger scheme of things. So you're sharing with, let's say, the person who is your leader. You, you, can, you can measure, like, how far do you want to go? Like, how far do you want to share your personal life? And then you keep your limitations. You keep your own boundaries. I'm sure that you're going to be very successful doing that. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Thank guys. you guys. Thank you so Thank much. You so Thank, much. You. Thank you.